guys, it's Kathy. So I got some more here. This first one is, is very short, but it's really good. It's um, two ladies have PTOs out against each other. <laughs> well, not yet, they're about to. In the same jail, <laughs> they're inmates together. It's so funny. Um, and then I got another PTO case that's, that's not so funny. Um, this guy's harassing these parents' daughter. I do not know how old the daughter is, so I, you know, I don't know if it, if she's a minor or not. Well, it never says, but um, I, I would think she's not a minor, just because, um, like I, I feel like there would be stricter, stricter, stricter things that happen if she was a minor. So we'll fight. We'll see. You'll see what I see. Um, and then I got a great appeals case. That's, that's sort of jaw dropping to think that it even happened at all, but there's no verdict. And I'm warning you, there's no verdict right now. So you don't have to sit there and watch it all and then just get up as upset as I was that there's, there's no verdict. But I, common sense leads me to think that I know what the verdict is, but maybe we can talk about it in the comments and, and see what you guys think it is. Um, before I put my two cents in, but let's start with this fun one. This, this is pretty good. Oh yeah. We also have one of my favorite judges and I know you guys, there's some people that make comments about judge Shackleford. And if you don't like her, don't watch because I love her and she's on top of her game today with someone who did something really not good at all. It's, it's terrible. And she lectures him just flat out and and he deserves it and he, he you know I, I think he deserves more than what he got but let's start with the fun one all right miss kago you're charged with simple battery mm -hmm. you must not have any contact with shante collins how do you know miss collins She's the ex-girlfriend. I'm the current girlfriend. She came over and busted down the door. I was inside the house. And I was trying to defend myself. Wait a minute. Say that. She's your what? What happened? You said she's you're the, the current. I'm the current girlfriend. She broke down the door, and I was defending myself when she broke down the door. Do you reside at this location? No, I did not know that she was there. I came over because she told me there was an emergency. Okay. Does she reside at this location? No, she does not. She came over uninvited. So I don't quite know what, what she meant there. A couple things. He, he said that, I mean, she said that she was called there because he said it was an emergency. So it sounds like, you know, the ex-girlfriend was already there and then he calls his current girlfriend over, which is stupid which really is stupid. But then she said that she kicks down the door and she was not invited, which makes it sound like she was already there when the girlfriend got there. But I don't know. I don't know what happened. Okay. All right. So, um, but you can't have any contact with Ms. Collins. I'm setting your bond at $2,000 and you must not violate any laws while you're out on bond. Do you understand the special conditions of your bond? Do you waive your preliminary hearing? No. All right, I'm going to go ahead and set that preliminary hearing for August 1st. It's 8 I am also going to go ahead and appoint my team to go help you tomorrow. Can't help the audio. That's just the way the audio was. It comes back. Don't worry. I appointed an attorney to you. Good luck to you. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions, Ms. Cagle? No. She just okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Collins? All right, Ms. Collins, you are charged with simple assault. That bond is set at 1500 Criminal trespass 1000 for a total bond of $2,500. You must stay away from Janae Cagle, and you may not return to that 330 Arrowhead Boulevard in Jonesboro, Georgia location. 
Do you understand the special conditions of your bond? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm going to set your preliminary hearing down for August 1st at 8.30 a.m. Excuse me. Uh-huh. I live on uh, Route 38. Uh-huh. And no, she does not. Hey, get your ass out. <laughs> but it's apartment living here. So you, you're saying you don't live in the 28D? No, oh, but I live in the same apartment company. All right, so I, I made sure I said the 28D okay, and okay. Not, not your location. <laughs> it's, it, it really isn't. Miss Collins, Miss Collins, yeah. it really isn't this serious. It's, it's this word. Being in jail for it. And you still, y'all still antagonistic over what? No. Move on with y'all life. Yes, ma'am. I mean, it, it, it's not worth it. it. Well, maybe it is to, to some people, but it, to me, it's not worth my freedom. No one is worth my freedom. Man. So um, I'm setting your preliminary hearing date for August 1st at 8.30 a.m. And I've also appointed an attorney to you. Good luck, Ms. Collins. I don't want to see you back, okay? All right. Good luck to you, ma'am. I am, Your Honor. Um, I just want to let the court know. So that was that one. Who thinks that she's going to see her back? I, I, I do. I, I do. A little bit. Um, Mr. Zaywell, prior to entering this plea, had actually attended, a, a, he had attended one of the uh, anger management classes at 8 hour one. I know there's a recommendation for the 12-week one. I'm not going to really fight too much on that. I just want to let the court know that he did. That was part of the reason for the plea. He had already taken some steps and he was getting back with his counselor and everything. Okay. I mean, he's got some. I saw Mr. Zick was present for a second here, but. And then, um, alternative, also, Your Honor, we did. Um, I spoke with, when we had spoken with the prosecutor, the prosecutor had spoken with the victim. There was an offer extended of the 77.1.1 on this. Uh, there's a recommendation from probation, though, that he does not get that due to the charges from that, quite frankly, he was never convicted of or anything from Minnesota. That was actually something that uh, Mr. Or Judge Salamone uh, inquired about before he even accepted the plea. Um, those were, that was back when he, I think he was like 20 or something, but him and his dad had a disagreement on um, how, you know, what he had to do to stay in the house. Um, he kind of explained that to Judge Salamone. He was satisfied at that time. Um, I asked that be given the opportunity to get the 771.1. First of all, those charges were all dismissed. dismissed. They were dismissed by a plea of guilty and then some version of 771 that he was never, I mean, he was arrested, but then not, I mean, never pled guilty. They were just dismissed. So um, I, I understand why they're holding it against him, but I think at the same time, I don't know if they should be holding it against him um, for the uh, fact of that. Uh, other than that, the balance of it, I don't have a problem with. My client did express a little bit of concern about being able to get the community service done, but I told him to uh, make a effort on that before. The reason why is he's in school and he does work about six days a week. So um, I told him to make an effort to try and get that done in the next three to four months and if he was falling short to come back and speak with your honor but um. all right well it's something judge Selmore took the plea and he accepted the plea and i have a note on here that Cobb's plea to 771 this is on a file from judge Selmore. I, I didn't take the plea yeah so um if sentenced to anything other than delayed sentence six months fine and costs and community service plea can be withdrawn right yeah. that was the agreement so and they're recommending 12 months, but they're re recommending it based on those Minnesota cases. I mean, it looks like to some degree anyway. I mean, I wouldn't withdraw his plea over six over 12 because I know he'd be eligible for a, uh, and her baby would be eligible to be released after six if he completed everything, if he petitioned yeah. the court. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't throw my hands up in the air. Really, I'm not. About any of this stuff, I just would like the seven seven one opportunity for well, him. He's going to keep the seven seven one. Oh, I, I'm going to give him the seven seven one. I mean, he doesn't have. That, that, they're not prior convictions. I was looking to see if they were expungements or set asides or something like that. Yeah, they, they were. And 
as far as I know, as far as the cops goes, and we have no, you know, I'm not, a slight deviation on it isn't going to uh, have us withdraw our plea or anything, but I would just ask that we be sentenced kind of in line with what we had with the cops and um, and the uh, well, blanking uh, pre-sentence report. Well, we had probation violations, so we had probation down there. And violated it. Right, you did probation down there. Yes, ma'am. You had two years. So they won't just dismiss. I, I, to be honest, I'm going off of looking at, I don't have access to a I have the out-of-state, yeah, I have the out-of-state so. record. He did do, I mean, he, he was on probation. It looks like he pled guilty to them, at least one of them. Right. He's going to keep, he's going to get his delayed sentence, but he's going to do the 12 months probation. That's fine. Good morning, Your Honor. Are we addressing the Mr. Zawa matter? Yeah. And do you have any thoughts on this, Mr. Zick? So um, I have the victim here, Your Honor. That's who I was speaking with in the breakout room when I was asked to join the courtroom. So if I could move her in, please. Yes, please. I'm sorry. I didn't know she was here. It's uh, Miss Laura Domino. And now this guy's about to have a bad day. I might need Miss Maudlin's assistance. I, I've tried twice now to move her in. I'm going to jump back in the the to join. Yes, we're, we're working on it. That's fine. Just give us one second. She called down to the Zoom clerk, Mr. Zick. Nothing's fast. All right. Um, you're, you're on on the bench on time. So when it takes a little bit like this, it's yeah. At the end of the I try. We try. Her and I were out here at eight fifteen today, but I'll just work from out here until something's ready. Hi, Miss Domino. Hello. Hi. Good morning, ma'am. We're on the record um, in the case against Nathan Zaywall. You're a complaining witness in this case. Um, and as the complainant, you have a right under the Crime Victims' Rights Act to make a statement to the court if you're so inclined. All right. Is there anything you'd like the court to know? Yes. Um, yes. Um, you know, I understand, I, I understand people get angry when driving. Um, but for somebody to get out of their vehicle, come up to another vehicle, and and... I'm as guilty as he was for yelling. We were both yelling. But I stayed in my vehicle. I was seat belted in my in my Jeep. This gentleman is half my age. And he punched me. By the time I realized the man punched me, he was already gone, ran the red light that he was sitting at, um, and took off. Now, this was just before Christmas and New Year's. Any plans that I had for Christmas and New Year's, I canceled. Because I didn't feel right for one thing going out looking like I did with my face all bruised up. Um, he punched you in your face? Yes. Ms. Domino, how old are you? I don't mean to, I know we're never supposed to ask a woman this question, but out of curiosity. I was 62 when he, um, when this happened. Okay. okay. Is there more that you wanted to tell me? Uh, 
Um, the only other thing is when my son found out, he was so panicked. And the first thing out of his mouth was, what if he had a gun? And nowadays you have to, you have to think like that. So I guess, yeah, that's about, that's all I've got to say. Oh, I, um, I guess I'm supposed to mention I did have $50 out of pocket for um, going to the doctors. And also I was supposed to have an MRI, but did not um, due to them going to charge me over $3,000. So I ended up canceling that. Okay. Mr. Zick, you offered this, or there was an agreement to 771.1. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. And this has been explained to Ms. Domino? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So, Ms. Domino, the prosecutor and defense counsel made an agreement, and the agreement is the defendant's going to be put on probation and monitored. And if he is compliant with all of the terms that I order, um, after a year, the, the case would be dismissed. It would be a non-public record. Right. But he, I'm inclined, if he's getting that, he's going to do everything I tell him to do over the course of his probation. You, sir, are a hothead. How old are you? You punched a 62-year-old woman in her face? In her face? My mother is 64. If you punched my mother in her face, I, I just, I can't even imagine what would come over a human being, a grown man, Who's got a woman here sitting? Do you punch her in the face when you're mad at her? Yes. Does he punch you? Shocking. It's shocking to me that someone you come in, you present very well, but underneath your nice shirt and your clean haircut, you're the kind of person that punches a 62-year-old woman in her face over a road rage incident. Shame on you. You are that type of person because you did it, Mr. Zaywal. You are that person. You're the type of person that does that. You're the person that does that. Thank God you don't have a gun. You can have 771.1. The victim's aware of it. The prosecutor agreed to it. You're doing 12 months probation. They're recommending 10 days community service. You're doing 15 days of community service in the city of Taylor. You can't have alcohol or controlled substances unless they're prescribed by a physician and documentation will be required and you're going to be subject to random drug and alcohol testing as deemed necessary. You're not to smoke marijuana while you're on probation. You're going to test clean for that in 30 days. And if you don't like it, you can bring your doctor in, your medical marijuana doctor, if you have one, and he can explain to me about your bona fide um, relationship. You're not doing it while you're on probation. Um, you have to stay out of establishments that someone serve alcohol. You're going to have no contact with Ms. Domino. How long of a, a, a anger management class did he do, Mr. Dare? It was like eight hour. So it was like a couple, I think we broke up in two four hour segments or four two hour segments. So that was all that was really available absent <laughs> signing up and yeah so you have two boys this I, i'm hoping that this was just the worst decision you've made because mr zaywall you're raising young men and young women and if young women see men act this way then they think it's okay for men to treat them that way and if young men see their father act that way, they think it's okay to act that way. So you have four 
little tiny humans that you're responsible for and how you behave in front of them and the type of character you have is directly going to affect the type of people they turn out to be. You're doing the 12 week anger management class. Yeah, are you gainfully employed? Okay. No weapons, no ammunition. Um, have you done uh, fingerprints? Yeah. You have, okay. And um, there's a fine of 50, court cost of 50, state cost of 50, crime victims rights fee of 75. Those two are mandated by the state of Michigan. There's probation oversight fees of $450 and community service fee. I gave you 15 days, so it's gonna be $150 um, of community service. Oh gosh, I'm bad at math. And Miss um, Domino, you said you had fifty dollars in um, unpaid bills you had to pay for. Yes. Is there any argument about a restitution of fifty dollars? Nope. Smart. It's eight hundred and seventy-five dollars, sir. That you're going to pay over the course of probation. I will take care. He will. Okay. One of your daughters is a very young teenager. Does she know you're here today? Sort of. If your daughter knows about this, I hope you two have a very serious. Was anyone in the car with you? I hope you have a serious conversation about like daddy was wrong, and this is not the way that people act. And this is not civilized. You gotta raise these kids right. All right. Is there anything else? Nothing for the people, Your Honor. Mr. Okay. All right, Mr. Zaywal. Those are my terms. And, and you'll talk to the probation department about whether or not you'd be eligible for early discharge in, in the in if you um paid off everything and, and did all of my requirements um, at the halfway period by law, you're entitled to request early discharge. And I'm required to tell you that. So, but you gotta do everything, do better. All right, we are all set. Thank you very much, Ryan. All right, thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Yeah, a lot of people don't like her, and I love her. I just love watching her courts. I love it when she goes on a, on a rampage like that. She's right. She's right about everything except, you know, I, I just think probation for, for punching a 62-year-old woman in the face. I, I just think it should be a little bit more than probation, uh, especially since it's not his first crime. He, he obviously got charged with this before because he had probation violations that, that he broke. Um, and that was his dad. So, uh, you know, who knows what, what he did? We don't know what he did, but what if it was, you know, what if he punched his dad and then he did it again and now he's getting probation and it's, it's going to be easy for him. There's not really anything. He has 15 hours of community service that he doesn't like, but other than that, nothing on his probation is, is terribly difficult, you know? So I don't know. Well, so we go to this next one and if you're a parent, um, you, you won't like this one. I, I didn't like this. There's, there's a few parts, but I, I just can't imagine uh, my daughter having to handle something like this. I think we've done everything except Mr. Salento, number six. Tony Salento, are you still on the line? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us now? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Walmart, he walked out of the room. <laughs> I'm here, I'm present, I'm Fran Barrett. Okay. All right, Mr. Salento, are you ready to go forward with this case? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, I can proceed. Mr. Walmart. No. Yes. Come on up here and sit at this table. Which table? Just up here. All right, 
Mr. Walmark and Ms. Barrett, you're the petitioners in this matter. Correct. Go forward, please. Um, well, this has been an ongoing uh, issue with Mr. Salento. No, I cannot fix the audio. That's his voice. Actually, my daughter uh, got a restraining order against Mr. Salento. I believe it was last year. I don't have the exact date. Um, and subsequently, he has shown up at our house three times since he's had the restraining order. And um, I have called the law enforcement officer each time. And uh, one of the sheriffs uh, suggested that my wife and I get our own restraining order. And so that's what we're attempting to do. Um, I, I'm not really sure what Mr. Salento's intention is to continue to show up in our house. I don't know what he wants. Uh, he's making us very nervous. Um, I, I, I have several questions. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to ask them or not, but I, we're just very concerned about his stability and uh, what, why he's bothering us. Does your daughter live in your residence? Yes, she does. And when he appears at your residence, does he uh, ask for her? He has in the past, yes. And um, he actually was used to be very uh, friendly and, and, and would acknowledge that he wasn't supposed to be there. But the last few times he was there, he has been <coughs> very agitated and uh, a little bit uh, unnerved. And one time he, was, he seemed very angry. And then the, th the last time, I didn't even acknowledge him. I just called 911 right away. And the last time, uh, one thing I forgot to do here. Um, Mr. Walmart and Ms. Barrett, and Mr. Salento, would you raise your right hand? I forgot to swear you in before this testimony here. Come on, uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in all matters in relation to this case today? <coughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. All right. So the answers to the questions I asked you previously would be the same uh, at this point? Okay. And the last time he appeared, uh, you said he called 911 right away. Yes, that's what I was instructed to do by uh, Detective Lockett. Lockett. Right. And was your daughter present at the time? Uh, the last time she was not. All right, so they didn't charge Mr. Salento with the violation of the order. Yes, they, uh, they did because he was still, I mean, the order is that he can't come to the property as well, not alone just my daughter. And he did, and so he has actually been uh, jailed twice now. The first time he came on after the her restraining order was February 6th. Um, they did not arrest him, which was okay. But then he showed up again on J June the 4th or June 12th. And um, he, he did get arrested one day. And then eight days later, he showed up again Jeez. and uh, was arrested again. And um, what I think was Judge Meyer put, put a bond on him for uh, to to hold him on until he could pay. I see. And then he's, I think he's been, and that's where I had him served at one point uh, while he was incarcerated. And we all know that's on all of our bucket lists. Let's get served while we're incarcerated. Is the order your daughter has from this court or from the Olympia Municipal Court? Uh, this this one. This court? Yeah. All right. You said you had some questions uh, of the court or of Mr. Salento? Well, um, I guess at one minute of Mr. Salento, I, I want to know why he keeps coming when he knows he shouldn't. I mean, I have a very two very long driveways, one from the, the uh, county road to my driveway and then a very long thing to my driveway. And as he's driving down there, I can't understand why he's not saying I should not be doing this and turn around. Why does he keep showing up? Okay. What else? Um, well, I, I have two, uh, one real good friend and another acquaintance that have also had problems with uh, Mr. Salento. One of them has her own That's restraining order because he was hanging out at her property, confused somehow with my daughter and then another uh, acquaintance 
had a run in with him and had to call the police on him as well. And so I guess one of my questions is, does he have any prior incidences that we don't know about? And what really is his mental state? I mean, he's got us pretty shaky. We've put up security uh, devices. We've got a gate across our road now. And he just doesn't seem to stop. Okay. Ms. Barrett, do you have anything you wish to add? Um, no, that just that he's made our life very uncomfortable and um, we don't feel safe in our home anymore. And that's that's that. So the last time he appeared was June 20th? Yes. All right. That we know of. All right. All right, Mr. Salento, what's your response to to the okay. um so this requested. is going to be the oh, okay. Hold on. What's oh, your sorry. response to the requested restraining order in this case? Okay. This is going to be a tale of two cities. So one side, you have the records, which have been going on. The other side, you have the sensibility of the trash bin. Now, the only person to know that is the Walmart. They will know about the trash bin, the lights, the noises from the neighbors and all that stuff. They would know what that means. Now, will they actually testify? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. This is the real world. But me coming over is because of those response. The trash bin, which they do know about it, and the lights, which they do know about it. That is it. Other than that, Your Honor, I really do not want to go over it. I, I don't want to bug them. Of course I do not want to bug them. I just thought that was the scenario. So someone also once asked, do I have family, parents to talk to? I do. I did talk to them, actually. They also told me I shouldn't go all the way to Hannah because they believe Hannah's playing me. Now, that's what they said. So, yeah. Someone also once asked me, too, why did it take so long to get there? Well, it took me so long as this. I do like Hannah. But I like Hannah to a point of favoritism, which is not a good thing because I don't, I'm not conscious. I don't do anything reasonable. I lash out. I have, you know, all that thing is not good for me. Do I, yes. Do I think she's very pretty and all that? Yes. But no, I'm not, I shouldn't go for her. And I know. All right. As a mother, he has gone so far over every single line that I have that I, I, I don't even have words to describe how, how freaked out I would be about him anywhere near my daughter. My daughters are, are, are not minors. So, and that would, that would just, I don't know how they deal with it. I, I don't know how Hannah deals with it. It's just, it's, it's horrible. So this is the stop and this is the stop. Beyond that. So that's all I just want to say. Now, <clears throat> it's confusing. It's, you look confused. Walmart, do you know anything about the trash cans and the lights he's talking about? I have no idea. What he's about no, the trash. Uh, maybe the, the lights. Not exactly sure. I mean, we've done some security measures, but he shouldn't know about that because he right. shouldn't be there. My uh, trash bin. My the trash bin. bin. So My be quiet bin. right now. Let Mr. Walmart speak, and then we'll have you give you another opportunity. Yeah, I have no idea what trash bin he's talking about um unless it's because he did have an altercation with a friend of mine uh, I, I don't recall the trash bin being involved in that and then i did hear him talking about uh some other people he threw a supposedly I, this is what they told me yes, a very large putty knife knife type thing over someone's house and into their yard almost striking them and this is what they were i was told and they went over to confront him about that. And he was very, very agitated and supposedly wouldn't open the door and talk to this other gentleman. Though, again, those are not things that I was involved okay. in. They're just things because I know these people. All right. And sir, so, so you said something, somebody told you to do go there to find out about trash cans or lights. Who told you? I'm talking to me. He said, I thought I understood you to say that someone told you to go to the property to find out about the trash cans or the lights. Uh, no one Who told you to go there. No one told me. It's just been an ongoing occurrence. That's all. Did anybody tell you well, not to go Yana, to that property? John, this thing has been going on for a very long time. And the thing is, Yana, it's not going to make sense because a lot of it is he said, she said. 
So the thing is, you want to, that's what's going on. Now, if this is about the end result of not going over there, then absolutely, you know, that, that, this is what we're going towards because I had enough too. So this is, you know, do you get it? <laughs> no. No, I don't, I didn't hear too much of that. Say that again and sit up because okay. you're uh, speaking okay. down and we but, can't but, really yeah, see okay. and hear what you're saying. Okay, where we at? What were we talking about? <laughs> oh, the trash bin. Yeah, this is getting really confusing. Um, what were you talking about? I'm sorry. All right, trash well, let me bin. ask you this question, okay. Mr. Salento. You said no one told you to go to the property to resolve some issues, correct? No. Did anyone tell you not to go to the property? Mm, yes, the judge. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. And you went anyway, is that right? You went again yeah. on the 20th of June? Yes. And you understand the terms of the order are you're not to go within a thousand oh, yeah. feet of the residence oh, yeah. of Ms. Walmart. Yeah. Correct? Yes. All right. So if I issue an order today that says you're not to go to the residence looking for either Ms. Walmart or Mr. Walmart or Ms. Barry, yeah. you'll stay away, right? Yes. Because you know what will happen if you violate the oh. order, correct? I, yes, I have a history of that. You'll be back in jail. I have a history of that too, yes. Right. Well, where? All right. At this time, I am going to enter the order when he said he had a history of jail, is that only from this incident? Or that is a very valid question from a parent who is concerned about their daughter. And the judge just blows it off and just ignores it. And I want to know the answer. I mean, they want to know the answer. Um, oh, and by the way, in a few moments, I cut a, a large portion of this out because the judge signs an order and it takes him a long, long time to sign, sign the order. It's just empty space. You don't really miss anything. Are there other instances? I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about okay. what's happened here. All okay. Right. We, we're trying to look forward and keep him from uh, you. coming to Thank your you. property, looking for you or for your daughter. So at this point, I'm finding, Mr. Salento, that there is a preponderance of the evidence um, that suggests that you are your actions in the past have been harassing to um, the petitioners in this matter, Mr. Walmart and Ms. Barrett. Um, and so I am going to enter the order today prohibiting you from going to their property at all. Do you understand that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And you understand what will happen if you violate it? Yes. And you know that now Ms. Mr. Walmart and Ms. Barrett uh, know what the remedy is, they will call the police and you know what will happen to you. Yes. You get arrested. Yes. Correct? Yes. All right. So at this point, there is no reason for you to go to their property at all. No. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. All right. think it's over but oh it's just begun it's just begun calendar Walmart and Barrett versus Salento case number 23-000198 um, I am going to enter a full protection order in this case I find that there's a preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Salento is aware of the existing no contact orders and he's not supposed to go to that property. There's no reason for him to go to that property. He has agreed that he knows he's not to go to that property. And so we will enter that order today to that effect. Um, <clears throat> So 
So, Mr. Salento, you're not to go to that property within a thousand feet of the of the residence. You're not to have any contact with these parties. You're not to have any contact with their vehicle or their workplace. You understand that? Yes. All right. You're not to keep them under any kind of um, electronic surveillance either. Creepy. In, in any way. Order is going to be in place for the next year. Mr. Salento, you can get a copy of this order from the website here at Thurston County District Court, um, and you will get served a copy of that by the Thurston County Sheriff at some point. Any questions, Mr. Walmart? Um, yes, I just have a, a few questions. I, I'm not really sure he understands this. I mean, just listening to the way he was telling his story and things. He seems very confused about things. And the fact that he's broken a prior restraining order three times, I don't have a lot. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're doing here, Your Honor, and all, all the help I'm getting. I'm just not sure he understands it. Um, and, and he does live um, a mile and a half from where I live. He lives on Summit Lake. Uh, we use that road as an exercise to run and things. I want him to be clear that he's not supposed to contact us as well. If he sees us running or walking down the road, that is not an invitation to engage with us. Again, that was one thing he did with my daughter. He thought they made eye contact, so he showed up my house. He thought it was a sign. It is not a sign, Mr. Slendo. If you see us walking or something on the road, it is not a reflection. We, we don't want contact. Just let us go. Um, I'm just not confident about this because he's broken it three times and, and listening to him today, talking about his rambling ways. I'm really, I'm really nervous about his mental state. I've seen him get very, very agitated. I've heard that from my friends that he, he's at his house screaming and yelling. Um, I know the police have been there several times. I, I, I'm just nervous about this. I understand that. Mr. Salento, you understand you're not to have any contact with Mr. Walmart, Ms. Barrett, or Hannah Walmart. You understand that? I, yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have no a contact problem. any way, no shape, way. or form. No way. Okay? Now, I have a half a billion dollar on what ladies. Oh, ladies. He has half a billion dollars he's working on. And I'm pretty sure. Although I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure he's single. I do not need to deal with them at all, Your Honor. So yes, I won't ever contact them ever again. No eye contact, no wave, no nothing. Ever. All right, Mr. Salento. Yes. Just have no contact. There will be no further problems. No contact. If you ever. have any contact, oh yes. you know what the result oh, is oh, likely to exactly be. Exactly. Oh yes. Never right. again. Creepy. Or Thank anyone you. else. I get it. All right. So. Does he get it or is he at their house right now? I think he's at their house right now. Mr. Walmart, I understand, but we're not in position to know what's in his mind to, you know, order all kinds of psychiatric evaluations and so forth. All we can do is put the order in place and if he violates it, you have then the opportunity to contact the police and they'll Correct. take the steps that they have to take. And Mr. Salento hopefully is aware that oh, the more of these that he, thought he gets accumulated, the greater the penalty could be on him. So oh, yeah. in terms of jail time and so forth. So that's something he's going to have to address and understand. We'll figure that out. Not our job to explain all of that further than what we've done so far. He's telling us on record he understands he's to have no contact. With anyone, exactly. Right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Salento. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Walmart. Do you have a course of action for me to pursue some of these other things? Because that's scary. I say we send him a taser and a video camera. Very watching him is there any I, I know why we're here today and i appreciate that your honor but is there any course of action i can proceed to feel safer well number one the court doesn't give out legal advice 
So I can't advise you as to any other steps that you may want to take in relation to that. Um, he had, he's an adult, he's responsible for his own behavior and please contact him and feel that there's a mental health issue, then that's something that they can pursue. Okay. And they have okay. shared that concern with me in the past, so I will pursue that. Something they'll have to pursue. All right. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right. You're welcome. I'll have a coffee for you in just a moment. Oh, okay. All right. If you made it this far, the last one, it, 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 there's, there's, there's no people in it. It's just lawyers and, and the judge, judges. Um, what I really like about this is in this appeals process, it's more like a conversation. The judges stop the lawyers continuously to ask them questions, um, to challenge their, their, their views constantly. It's, it's back and forth. I mean, there's a lot of lawyer talk over long, long, long-winded lawyer talk. That's just what you get when you watch court cases. But like I said at the beginning, there is no verdict here. So if you want to bail out now, go. Um, I thought it was jaw dropping. Like what, what they did in their first trial. And then they come to the appeals court and say, yeah, well, we, you know, we did this, but, but we're, we're allowed and we didn't expect consequences. Well, yeah, this is the consequences that happens when you do what, when, when you do or actually don't do what you did, it's just stupid. Um, but yeah, I, I left it in because it was interesting and, and great and, and I, I loved it. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 5th District Court of Appeal. We have two cases on our docket today. Uh, with me is Judge Eric Eisenagel, also uh, Judge Joe Boatwright. Uh, counsel, you've set aside, I guess, five minutes for a rebuttal, or would you like something different? No, Your Honor. Five minutes would be fine. Thank you. Okay, very good. We'll start, uh, start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, and may it please the Court. Jack Ryder on behalf of Travelers. And Your Honors, I'm going to focus primarily today on the focus of the issue of whether or not this verdict is against the manifest weight of the evidence and our remitted or argument. And Your Honors, this is a verdict, $16 million verdict, that is clearly contrary to the manifest weight of the evidence and bears no reasonable relationship to the evidence presented. And we believe a new trial is warranted or at a minimum a remitted or. And here, Your Honors, the trial judge openly expressed her own shock at the outcome here. If we look through both throughout the hearing um, on our post-trial motion and in the order that the trial court entered, the court noted at, for example, at the record at 2529 that, quote, most death cases don't come back like this. Most quadriplegic cases don't come back with these numbers. And the judge noted in that same record site that, quote, there seems to be a disconnect about her injuries in the verdict vis-a-vis -vis verdicts that are rendered in the state every day. And here, Your Honors, what we had was a plaintiff who respectfully, while she did suffer injuries, and we acknowledge that, this wasn't a case where she had broken bones or head injury or paralysis. Uh, there was a period of two years which she did not treat in any way. She did not have surgery before trial, and it was unknown if she ever did have surgery. She treated with Advil for headaches. She never ceased working, worked full time, uh, lives on her own, testified that she continues to go boating, hiking, traveled extensively. Well, and well, counsel, if I can interrupt, just to get the context of this case, your client put on no evidence, correct? That's correct. Made well, no, no witnesses. Let me, let me rephrase well, let that. Me, let me finish. No witnesses. I mean, come back and, sit and fill, yes, in, fill in the blanks for me. No objections at trial to, of, any, of anything. And then waited until after the verdict to file a motion for new trial remittiture at, at that point, correct? With one okay. one point, Your Honor, there isn't to suggest that the defendant put on no evidence is, is a bit of a misnomer because the parties jointly put in the medical records and the defendant relied upon the medical records as joint exhibits and the defendant cross-examined witnesses. We did not put on a specific case in chief, but to be clear, the defendant did, and I, and I think there's two some very critical points here. Well, what I hear you saying though is you, you put independently on no independent witnesses or any independent evidence. It's only what was stipulated to. We did not put in our own experts or our own evidence. We relied on the examination of the plaintiff's witnesses and the joint 
uh, exhibits, which were presented together, and we rely on those medical records for purposes of arguing that the verdict is against the manifest weight of the evidence and that a remitter was warranted. Great. And I would highlight, Your Honor, and this is something that I believe the trial judge misapprehended, the defendant has no duty to put on evidence. The defendant has no duty in terms of um, whether it's presenting evidence as uh, competing well, that's, experts. That's true, counsel, but the defendant you know, has to abide by the standards of review. And there's no objections made, and there's only evidence the jury had was what the plaintiffs put on, and it was cross-examined, of course. I mean, that leaves you with just the fundamental error standard, correct? Uh, no, Your Honor. That's not, that is, respectfully, that is not accurate. This is not about fundamental error. If we do have a fundamental error argument, but not as our threshold point. The threshold point is that on, taking on the, the manifest waste, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but on the manifest waste, weight, weight of the evidence, you did make a argument along those lines below. Well, we've moved for new trial in the manifest way. In other words, in other words, we our position, Your Honor, is that a defendant doesn't have to raise an objection or put on evidence or even be at trial. A case could go against a defendant in absentia or a defaulted defendant, and the the, the judge still has a now, duty. So I guess I'm just not entirely sure. I, I understand how I understand how how you are interpreting the trial judge's judge's comments, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the trial judge uh, analyzed the motion the way that you're you're interpreting it, right? I mean, why didn't the trial judge just basically say, hey, look, the jury had all, all of this evidence. You you don't like their the result. Um, and gee, maybe it would have been different had you offered some alternative evidence that, that the trial judge could then sort of compare it to, right? But when there's just one story told, gee, I, the trial judge says, I don't know that that's, I can't say that the verdict is against the manifest weight of the evidence from that point of view. Gee, had you offered some alternative evidence, maybe it'd be a different story. Why isn't that what the trial court was saying? Because what the trial judge did here, Your Honor, is weigh the evidence not against the outcome based upon the injuries suffered which I believe the court, the trial judge had a duty to do both under Florida law and under the remitter statute, which provides a legislative mandate to examine the evidence compared to the outcome. But what the trial judge did respectfully was say that she, instead of looking at the evidence compared to the outcome, the trial judge extensively focused on defense counsel's performance, talking about it as a quote, failed strategy, unquote. In fact, she specifically wrote in her order at 2368 that the court is not inclined to excuse remedy mistakes of trial strategy, unquote. And then at the record of 2377, the judge wrote, the court is guided in large part by the fact that little defense was presented and that this, ju this jury was given little choice to return the verdict. And at 2364, the judge said, it is not this court's job to save counsel from its mistakes, unquote. The point, Your Honor, is that when under Brown versus Stuckey, when examining the, whether or not a verdict is contrary to the manifest weight of the evidence, the court has a duty to examine whether or not a $16 million outcome is consistent with the weight of the evidence presented, regardless of whether or not the defendant did a, a, a quote, good enough job, unquote, or made mistakes, unquote. And again, even if there had been a default judgment or a case had gone against a defendant in absentia, if a outrageous runaway verdict was returned, the plaintiff, excuse me, the trial judge would have an independent duty to examine that verdict and examine whether or not it was consistent with the manifest weight of the evidence. And when we look at the remitter factors under each remitter standard to examine whether or not the verdict was shocking to the conscience. Here, the trial judge in assessing this verdict focused extensively on the fact that the defendant, according to the trial court, didn't do a good enough job or made mistakes or didn't object or had a failed strategy or didn't put on evidence. A defendant has no duty to put on evidence. And for purposes of whether or not the verdict is inconsistent with the evidence or whether it should be remitted, I would respectfully submit that the defendant's conduct or the uh, uh, the manner in which the case was presented, or if a case was not presented at all, should not in any way factor into the equation. If we look at it this, under the statute, for example, under remitter. Well, it, counsel, doesn't it, it has to factor in, doesn't it? I mean, if, if, if you had presented evidence, then the trial judge would have had additional evidence to consider, right, in the weight of the evidence analysis. The fact that there, 
that your side presented no evidence whatsoever necessarily affects that analysis. Now, maybe it's not dispositive, but it absolutely has an impact. And, right? and, and Your Honor, I would submit that the defendant did present evidence, oh, for okay, example. But, 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 um, but you know what I mean, right? So well, obviously what we're saying is I understand you, you presented some joint exhibits and cross-examined, but you offered no experts. You offered no alternative calculation, right? So uh, I guess I, what I'm, all I'm saying is you said it has nothing to do with it. And it seems that it necessarily does. That your your argument probably, depending on what evidence you presented, if you, had you presented your own expert, assuming you know they were they they offered some evidence that was or an opinion that was substantially different, um, that necessarily would make your argument here stronger. And I, I, your honor, I understand the court's point, but we are accepting the evidence as it was presented in its entirety. In other words, if we look at this record as exactly as it came in, even if the defendant had not been present in the courtroom, I believe, and I believe the law requires the trial judge to evaluate the standards under both Florida law and the remitter statute. For example, we, accepting the evidence as it was pre presented, at the record at 1402, that was a medical record that indicated that the plaintiff had resumed all of her activities and was pain free. Um, the evidence taken as its entirety, and I already outlined the plaintiff's explanation of the impact this had on her life. Now, when we look at the remitted or standards, under the statute it says that, quote, it shall be the responsibility of the court to review the amount of the award to determine if it is clearly excessive or inadequate in light of the facts and circumstances which were presented to the trier of fact. And if the court finds that the amount awarded is clearly excessive or inadequate, it shall order a remitter or additor. But it, did, but it didn't. And it, had, it did look at everything, and it's, it didn't. So it's now here. And isn't our standard of review you know, arbitrary and capricious or something along, along those lines? Well, t technically, Your Honor, I would submit that at, at best for the use plaintiff, of, it's use abuse of discretion. discretion. Right. Okay. But, but I would again submit that the trial judge respectfully did not apply the factors. The factors were identified in the order, but let's be very clear. The judge stated in her ruling that much of her decision is based on the fact that she wasn't going to save counsel or travel. Well, well, I, I read the trial judge's order. What she said actually is basically saying you, you guys committed legal malpractice. I feel the same way. I, I didn't read the record. I didn't see the, the court case, but I feel malpractice. You didn't put on a case, you did nothing. Now you expect me to do your job for you. Yeah, I'm not saying you, I'm just saying. I don't know, I understand, Your Honor. I, I understand. I mean, that's, that's as plain as day to me. That's, that's, that was what the trial judge felt. The trial judge did feel that way. And I believe, again, that when we look at the standard under the statute, which says that a verdict that is excessive shall be remitted, shall be reduced, that whether or not the defendant committed, as the court notes, legal malpractice, or whether or not the defendant wasn't even in the courtroom, it doesn't obviate the trial judge's duty to examine the factors. And by looking at the defendant's- but, but, but we, Don't we have to assume the trial judge examined each and every factor because it's in the order? I, Your Honor, I Maybe respectfully- Maybe misapplied them, but not, didn't even consider them? I would submit, again, that it is not to, I do not believe that should be assumed here. I do not. In fact, I would state to the contrary. I believe that if the judge had applied the standard appropriately, if the judge had applied, whether we look at it again from manifest weight or from the remitted or factors, if we go through each one, the judge unfortunately did not apply the, fan, the standards Under, correctly. On the remitted or issue, yes. um, I guess one thing that is, I'm curious about is you know, below you argue that the the amount should be reduced, I think, to 1.5 something and change, right? Is that correct? 1.5 and change? Yes, Your Honor. million and change. And then you, you make the same argument um, in your brief. So I guess the question becomes, I mean, that's a pretty low number in comparison to the actual verdict. I mean, that was, a, that was, a, that was an aggressive uh, position to take, I, I think. Um, we, can, we might be able to agree on that at least. But regardless, what, what if the trial court thought, well, Gee, 16 million is is too high, but 1.5 is way too low. Um, and then you you argue 1.5 again here. Are we are how how cabined are we by the art the actual amount that you argued below and on appeal? What I would submit is that the court should 
reverse and remand with directions to the trial judge to make that conclusion in the first instance. And what I mean by that is we, we offered a number. We did. And our number was based upon reviewing 34 different verdicts that we looked at. No, I, I guess if you could just answer my question very directly and then, and then sure. offer. But I guess what I'm asking is, is, is it all or nothing? No, Your Honor. Okay. Explain it's not. that to me. Sure. Um, and that's so this court and the trial judge were not bound by the $16 million verdict or our 1.5 approximately uh, number that we proposed. The court is bound to examine the evidence and to determine whether or not it would have been appropriate to reduce it based upon what here, what the judge recognized was higher than verdicts awarded to plaintiffs who've suffered far more catastrophic injuries and death cases. So the answer to your question is no. There is no government, nothing I see in the case law suggests that it's an all or nothing. Um, the trial judge, but but here again. The so and and, that, and and that's a fair point. So your argument is, look, the trial judge still had discretion to say, hey, look, 1.5 is way too low. Pick a number, but six is right, and do that. But on appeal, you've argued 1.5. Your Honor, so that's a different issue. That's a different issue. I, it, it's at least argued potentially different. Um, you've made the argument to us. We can't re rewrite your arguments for you. Uh, the way I read your brief, it says we should the remitter should be 1.5. Are we bound by that? N no, Your Honor. I mean, there's no there's nothing in the Florida law that I'm aware of that suggests that a court, either at the trial level or at the appellate level, is bound to accept a number proposed. We offered an alternative based upon our interpretation of what, what well, but we thought. Counsel, we're bound by your arguments. We can't re we can't make arguments for you. We can't rewrite your arguments on appeal. So. How, how can we then say, well, and you didn't argue that it should be re remanded for just any number, any reduction? Well, actually, I believe, Your Honor, we, if, if you look. Oh, did you? I believe we did in our brief. I mean, we, we I, I believe we suggested that it be reversed and remanded to the 1.5, um, but I believe if you, if the way we present our argument is that it can also be remanded, I believe, Your Honor, for the court to remit in the first instance or for this court to remit it or this court to remit it to $1.5 million. I mean, I stand by the number we proposed as I believe to be a far more appropriate um, reference point when compared to verdicts that are returned across the state and when compared to the damages assessed, asserted you, by the When plaintiff. you're talking about the uh, verdicts uh, across yes. the state, um, do the statutory factors in 768-043 require that the judge um, review those? The statute itself the statute doesn't talk itself. about the. It doesn't. The, it, doesn't yeah. it doesn't talk about that, does it? It does not. Okay, so but that's just other courts have said, and she may consider. I think that's, that's what correct. Courts, I think that might be in your brief, correct? So that's correct. She's not. She's not bound by those other verdicts. Not bound by the other verdicts, but certainly bound to examine whether or not, under the factors, this is a case where the verdict reflects something that is indicative of passion or prejudice, uh, whether or not. The, um, it appears that the trier of fact misapprehended the evidence, whether or not the trier of fact took into account improper elements, and whether or not the award basis... I'm, I'm talking specifically about those verdicts. There's nothing sure. in the statutory language that required her to review those as part of her comparison, correct? The statute does not. Okay, Florida you. Counsel, did you want to reserve time for rebuttal? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, you're about at about five minutes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Court. My name is Brian Lee. I represent Jessica Long in this appeal. I wanted to start by uh, reading the court just a brief excerpt from the Florida Supreme Court in the case of JB versus State. It's a, it's a case that I cited in my brief, and it talks about the importance of what a contemporaneous objection does. And I think that is relevant to what we're talking about here. Since the contemporary objection rule serves several purposes, most notably the rule provides an opportunity for trial judges who are most familiar with the case and proceedings to respond to objections. Further, it prohibits counsel from attempting to gain a tactical advantage by allowing unknown errors to go un undetected and then seeking a second trial if the first decision is adverse to the client. 
Only when error is fundamental can the error be raised on appeal in the absence of a contemporaneous objection. And as I've set forth in my brief, fundamental error for civil cases, the case law is very clear, is exceedingly rare, meaning that courts should only in exceedingly rare cases say that something is fundamental error. And so when we look at the trial court order in the context of what the case law says about objections and about fundamental error, I believe this court's going to see that the trial court did every bit of analysis that the appellant says she did not. Um, yes, did she talk about the fact that the defense counsel at the trial didn't object once, didn't, or excuse me, didn't object substantively at all, uh, what, what, didn't. What, what about the motion after, after the verdict? The motion sure. that basically said, hey, this verdict is out of whack, it's too high, it's against the manifest weight of the evidence. I mean, what if the jury verdict came back and it was a billion dollars? Sure. Okay, now they made a proper motion to try to correct that. And in this case, I would presume if, it, you know, if the trial judge upheld a billion dollar verdict, we would probably overturn it. I'm just thinking, you know, speaking out loud, not for my colleagues, but I mean, under the facts of this case. Um, and that, that would have been a preserved argument and that we would be entitled to provide relief. But that's, I mean, this, that's not the, this case, right? So we have one in which it's really the non-economic, the 11 million, in my view at least, the, the 11 million, because that's 11 out of 16 million. 11 million of the 16 million verdict is future non-economic damages. So isn't that where the action really is, is that that's, that's the amount that they're really targeting? Well, what I, th I believe what they're arguing, Judge, and, and just uh, I, I could be wrong about this, but they are the only part of the jury verdict that they are not contesting is the past medical expenses that the jury awarded. They are wanting this court, and, and they want the trial court, to remit the future medical uh, expenses. Uh, that's their argument, Dr. Sherbin. Um, I'm I gonna think, get counsel, I think there's, 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 you're right. They're challenging almost everything, but I think Judge Maycar was more trying to laser in on um, the perhaps the biggest part of the case, and that is the non-economic damage. Okay, right? sure. I, I, and, I, and I think the point he was making was simply this, that at some point, the fact that they didn't present anything in their case doesn't win the day for you. That is not dispositive. That's not the law. There's still a manifest weight of the evidence standard. And if the verdict here was a billion dollars, can you agree with us, with me, and apparently Judge Maycar, that that would be reversible because it would be against the manifest weight of the evidence? A billion dollar verdict. A billion dollar verdict, yeah, I could, okay. I could agree right. with that. So Concessions the fact, are okay. Yeah. Concessions so the, are okay. Well, yeah, when we're asking about a billion dollar verdict. It's, so, so the point is this, the fact that they didn't put on any case at all it is, I mean, it's difficult to understand um, for sure, but that doesn't win the case for you, right? You, we, the tr trial judge still had to look at the evidence that was presented. And again, yes. a lot of it came in without objection. A lot of it was objectionable, but they didn't object. So it came in, right? The trial judge still has to look at all that evidence and decide, is the verdict, the $11 million for non-economic damages based on this evidence, is that against the, the, the manifest weight, correct? I agree. Okay. And, and she did. Um, when you look at her order, I- She I, did seem, I mean, the, I think part of the problem is she, she focused heavily on the fact that they didn't offer any case, right? I mean, there, there was quite a bit of discussion on that. Point. There was, but I, I think that as the court has already noted, when you talk about things like manifest weight of the evidence, and really actually remitted her also, there is no way to divorce entirely the fact that there was no counter evidence entered. Because, of the, because when you're talking about manifest way to the evidence, the, a court is looking at a balancing, like a weighing, and saying, you know, on this side I have this, on this side I have this, is there something that tells me that the manifest way of the evidence should have led to a different result. Well, I think we already established, though, that, that it's not always uh, this versus that. It could just be there's one side of the story here, but it's not, it, there's no way it's worth a billion dollars. 
No, I, I agree with that, Your Honor, but that's not what the trial court did. That's what the defendant wants to, that's what Travelers wants this court to believe. That's not what the trial court did. Did the trial court put in the order things like no objections and things? Absolutely. It, it's in that order. But I would also say the motion for a minute or the order, portion of the order that talks about that motion is from record site 2393 to 2401. It's eight pages. <clears throat> The trial court does not just talk about the lack of evidence. She does. But she also goes through every single factor that is in, that is within the remitter statute. She talks about the comparable verdicts. She talks about how she does not believe that those are comparable because of the stance of this case and because of what the evidence was. And so when she goes through all these particular points in the remitter statute, Regardless of what she says otherwise, she has done what Florida law says she's supposed to do. What, 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 what about the part where she says that she's guided by? Uh, I think something, and I, I'm not going to, this is not an exact quote, but for sure the words guided by and the, the fact that there was no evidence presented on one side. I mean, th that kind of contributes to, I think, um, opposing counsel's argument here. So how do, how do you... How would you phrase, how would you explain that? Sure. Um, and she does say that. She says, I think it's at page 2401, she says um, the court is guided in large part, yeah. right? She says that. But immediately after that, she she goes through, again, this is in her conclusion section. This is after she's done all the analysis and she and, and Judge Deering's going through a conclusion. She talks about everything that I've talked about. And then at the end of it, she says, Nevertheless, goes through all the, you didn't do the evidence. It says, nevertheless, the court recognizes that if it found this verdict shocking to the judicial conscience, it would be required to grant a remitter, even if the amount proposed by the defendant was not based on the actual evidence presented at that trial. She recognized that even without everything else, she would be required to do that. At the end of the day, she did not do that based upon her analysis she made. And so when we look at this particular order, the abuse of discretion standard uh, is, is twofold, especially when you're talking about a remediator. The You have an abuse of discretion based upon what the jury did, meaning the jury's verdict is given weight by this court. But it's also buttressed, and the case law that I've cited to talks about it's strengthened by the fact that the trial court then looked at it was there at the trial, was the, was the judge that was there in person to hear the evidence and decided that a remediator was not warranted. And so I heard Judge Maycar, I think, talking about the arbitrary and capricious standard. I've seen that before. It's kind of a heightened standard. It's, it's more than an abuse of discretion standard that this court would need to say happened because Judge Deering's order strengthened the jury verdict itself. And it's not that it wasn't, it didn't have evidence. One of the things that the, that Travelers doesn't really deal with within its briefing is that this was not a situation where uh, the person was older, was a 80 year old person, only had maybe a three year statistical life expectancy. This was a Jessica Long was, and I may get this wrong, I hopefully I don't, she had 53 but she years. was 26 she, at the time life, of the crash. The life, expectancy the, was the life expectancy was 53 years. And the only evidence that the jury was given was that she was in pain, she had been in pain since the crash, and not only that she would continue in pain, continue with mental anguish, all of the different elements that Jessica Long proved to the jury, but that those would get worse in the future. Plus, adding on to that, she would need all this future medical care. Can we go back to the uh, future non-economic damages? Didn't your, I mean, even legal counsel, Ms. Long's legal counsel, I think he asked for about seven and a half million, and they came back at about 11.3. Is that a reason to reduce? I mean, he asked for $10 an hour, and they gave a lot more than that. Is that not a reason to reduce the verdict? No, it's not because uh, of the fact, and this is just straight from the case law, that the what counsel's arguments are to the jury about the method that they should use to uh, award their damages is only that. 
It is. It, it's what counsel wants them to do. The jury has the ability to accept it, reject it, or do something else. Um, and the case law very clearly says that especially, because we're kind of honing in on non-economics, especially with that type of damages, that is we are asking the jury to measure what the case law says is, is typically an immeasurable. And so there's a huge amount of deference that is given to the jury to determine that. Counsel, and there is I, no formula for doing that. What I hear, hear you saying, I think I'll, I'll put it this way. When, when I read the facts and the evidence and then saw and, and, and the verdict, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was pretty surprised at the number. It seemed quite high. Your point is, is that that's not the standard on appeal. It's not. Yeah. And, 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 and sorry, if the trial ahead. judge had granted a new trial or remitted her and said, hey, this is too high, um, I assume that based on that same very deferential standard of review on appeal, you, you would say probably that would also be an affirmance. Well, and, tra and travelers would be telling yes. that, coming up and giving you the same case as I am that says that that trial court's decision has a lot of weight. For this court, and I and I wanted to touch on something I think that you said or uh, that I was going to talk about. The case is the case law is very clear, and this is undisputed. I think that there there's this concept between sort of raising a judicial eyebrow that you see in the case. Well, that's what the, didn't the trial judge use that phrase? The trial court even used that yeah. phrase and said, and and the trial court frankly said, look, is, is this something that I might have given a jury? Maybe not. You know, but that's not the standard. And she recognized that. She recognized that she had to divorce herself as the trial judge from what the statute says, from what the law says. And so she and she found that this verdict did not shock the judicial conscience. And I, I could just give you the numbers, Your Honor. The numbers are four point five million dollars for future medical care. 131,000 for past medical. 451,000 for past non-economic damages um, and 7.5 million for future non-economic damages. So in, in, we're sort of maybe talking about a three to one ratio for the past and maybe a two, not even a two to one, less than a two to one, meaning that it's double, it's, it's less than double what it is. Now, Counsel, does that- Counsel, you asked for 7.5 on the future of non-economic, right? But the jury awarded 11.3, isn't that right? At least that's what it says here. Um, maybe right, yeah, right. So, I mean, we're, talk we're talking about- So, so my, my question is, you asked for $10 an hour for the right. next 53 years. The jury awarded an another number. I don't have a calculator, but by hand, I can, looks like it's around 14 or $15 an hour based upon my calculation. So the jury came up with that number. What was the evidence at trial? You said 10. Did that come from an expert? And then was it cross-examined? Did they say, no, no, it should be $5 an hour? If you could just fill me in on that. Sure. No. Um, the, the evidence was um, from Mrs. Long, uh, from Jessica Long, about the hours, right, uh, of per day, per Per, um, for each of the categories of non-economic damages. The numbers themselves, meaning that how much is an hour, was based upon sort of a per diem hourly rate uh, that Mr. Block put in front of the jury as a suggested way to determine these damages. That's something that's done very, um, really, throughout Florida. And the reason it is is because of the fact that the Florida law says there is no set formula for the jury to use that. And so what the, and so what counsel do is they put their own formula. They, they say, sometimes they say you should this much per year. There's no, there's no set hourly rate either by law or in the jury instruction. There is not, and there is not. And, and that's why it is a suggestion to the jury. And frankly, that's why the jury when could we say hourly, not do it. We're talking about the testimony at trial of the number of hours per day that she was in pain Right, and that, that sort of thing, right? Correct. Yes, and so there, so there was counsel. We don't even, we don't even really know what the for formula the jury used, do we? I mean, the, the no. jury could have just entirely rejected your ten dollars an hour thing, and could have rejected an hourly sort of number, and just and and come up with some other cal way to calculate this non-economic damage number, right? Very true. And and the trial court, I think, even noted in her order that it was unknown to her, frankly, to the parties, exactly what the jury did. And that is the point. The When the trial court is looking at a remitter motion, that's why those factors are in there. 
Was, was the argument that it was 24 hours a day for the next 53 years? Um, no, I believe that there was that there was arguments as to each element of the damages. Each of the non-economic damages, um, the case law says, can be awarded basically on their own. So the amount of pain and suffering, the amount of inconvenience, loss of enjoyment of life, and et cetera, et cetera. So there was, there was evidence given to the jury about each of those elements, and Mr. Block said you could assign this number to those elements. 24 hours a day, or was it? 16 hours when she's awake. Um, I don't. I don't know exactly. I'd have to look at it, Judge. But I, I'm just trying to figure out what the jury had before and what the. I also, in the time you have left, want to hear about the cross examination. In other words, what number did they put forward? Was it, did they give an hourly number? I, they didn't give anything. Um, nothing. Nothing. They didn't give any formula at all. Nothing. So you could see where I'm leaning. You could see where I think this verdict is going. Defense counsel did not, uh, from what I recall from the record, and I'm sure counsel will tell me if it's otherwise, basically just said, do whatever you think is right. There, there was no formula that was given to the jury by defense counsel, no um, analysis of that. Frankly, Your Honor, there was no, there was no evidence to rebut what Mrs. Long said was all these hours. So that is it. so. I, I guess what I, I want to just in my time remaining, I want to sort of paint the picture here. the The jury was given all of this evidence. The jury was given undisputed evidence from uh, Miss Long about how she suffered and how she still suffered. The jury was given undisputed evidence as to the amount of years that she would have this per, these permanent injuries and would suffer these non economic damages. And then in closing argument, the jury was given a formula. Uh, Mr. Block said, this is the formula that I would suggest to you. You can use what you want. And the jury did not have to follow it. Um, the jury could have done their own formula. We don't know. But that is not the point because of the fact that the, when the judge looked at all of these factors, when the judge looked at the evidence that the jury had, she said, look, I'm not going to look at this evidence like all the stuff you said shouldn't have come in didn't come in. Because that's, that's part of Traveler's argument, is that, well, you should look at all this evidence that came in and sort of take that out and say, well, it shouldn't have came in. So that means the manifest way of the evidence wasn't, was not against us. That is not the correct way to look at it because the evidence was there. Look, can I ask you one before your time is out? Um, on the yes. future medical expenses, uh, Dr. Sherbin, I think he testified that Ms. Long may need a couple more neck surgeries if the first one went bad. Um, is that a reason at that point? Is that an abuse of discretion to not reduce the award at that point? Is that allowable? It is allowed, Your Honor. I, I set forth all the cases that talk about even things like possible um, are, are okay no for that. No testimony or no witnesses to rebut what he said, correct? Correct. And also, at, if you look through his testimony. accepted a joint, was a, you had a joint exhibit with all those expenses, which they jointly entered into evidence, correct? That's what right. You? And then when, during his testimony, he was asked multiple times by Mr. Block um, as to every single category and cost, um, do you have this opinion within a reasonable degree of medical certainty? So it's not even that he said possible, probable, no object, or no opinion about reasonable certainty. He was asked very specifically at trial, was every single one of them, and he said yes to every single one of them. And so the evidence is very clear that this would have came in based upon the testimony. If there was an objection, what would have happened? We don't know. But before, we, before you sit down, Long made a offer of settlement. I think it was for a hundred thousand. Was that it? I'm sorry. What? Your Honor? Wasn't there an offer of settlement? The policy limits, the UN policy limits. Did they make a? Did, was there an offer of settlement? Demand for at judgment the, at, I guess. The, at the policy limits. I, I, I don't okay. know, that's Judge. Fine. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> but I, I don't know, Judge, because okay, that wasn't fine. part. That's, that's fine. We'll figure it out. Figure out. Um, so, Your Honor, for all the reasons that I've set forth, as well as my brief, this court should affirm. Thank, Thank you, you counsel. Your Honors, just to 
one quick point on page two of the reply brief, we do specifically note that the case uh, could be remanded for a minute or two an appropriate sum. So I wanted to just answer Your Honor's question about our position. Our position does remain that we put in what we believe to be a more appropriate number, but we also included in our brief an argument that it could be remanded to be remitted to an okay. appropriate sum. I mean, counsel, sum. for future yes. reference, uh, you, usually you can't make a new argument in a reply brief. I'm not sure of any example where you can actually, but Your Honor, usually again, those arguments need to be made in the initial brief. Your so I don't even know what to say right now about this whole team of lawyers. Now, it sounds like this lawyer who's speaking right now wasn't at the first trial. I, I don't know. I don't know. So it, so it, it sounds like maybe he was, but in another, it sounds like maybe he wasn't. So I, I don't know if, if he was at the first trial, but again, the, the, the other drug judge told him today that he can't redo his argument. You said 1.5. Judges aren't allowed to redo his argument for him. And now here, in a rebuttal, he's going, he's going back, oh, it, I'm not a lawyer, and even I know that's not a, you're not supposed to do that. Honor, again, I, and I'm respectfully, it was not a new argument. It I'll, was just I'll, a framing. I'll, I'll go back and look it, it was just the, a framing of the argument. For, just so you know, I'll go back and, and reread that section just to make sure I hadn't misread it. Thank Counsel, you, one Honor. thing I was uh, thinking about is, um, you, you focus a lot in your brief about on the fact that Ms. Long goes, you know, went back to various activities um, and sort of, you sort of point to that, that, well, she went, I guess it was walks on the beach and Universal and theme park and, and various things. Um, and you sort of say, hey, look, this is a reason why this verdict is, is out of line. It's too much. But I mean, I guess I, I, we don't really know how the jury evaluated. Couldn't couldn't that the fact that she was so active before the car accident actually hurt your case in front of the jury? That that she wasn't she she wasn't just sitting around watching TV. She was doing all these active things, and now she testified very clearly. She can't do them like she used to be able to. She doesn't do them as much, and she can't do them as you know when she does go then do and do them. She has to rest, and and it's shorter periods, and she can't enjoy what she used to do as much, doesn't that potentially hurt you? Uh, your Honor, no, it, it does not. Um, the problem here, Your Honor, is not when the question for the trial judge when examining the remitted or factors is what it specifically does the award bear a reasonable relationship to the damages proved and injuries suffered and whether it is supported by evidence in a logical manner. The fact is, okay, and this goes back to respectfully the the reason why we do examine comparative verdicts is because when you have a circumstance where you have a $16 million award and $11 million of that for future pain and suffering, and you have an individual who described the activities she continues to do, where she testified that there's no activity she did before that she no longer is able to do, but it is now different, was her testimony. Um, the, the bottom line is, is that if a person continues to enjoy a certain quality of life, when one compares that to the catastrophic nature of injuries suffered where awards are far less, as the trial judge recognized and stated over and over again, then that under the statute requires a reduction. The court, and I, I believe, I understand that the court referenced, the trial judge referenced the factors, the remitted or factors, but the point is, is that the court in her order said conclusion at 2374, quote, as this order makes clear, the court is guided in large part by the fact that little defense was presented, unquote. And I respectfully submit that that has nothing to do with the statutory factors that require a verdict to be remitted. And I, I will say, Judge, it, respectfully, it makes no difference if we suggested it be remitted to $1.5 million or a dollar. It has no bearing on the judge's independent duty to reduce a verdict that is excessive. And this court, if the court believes that $11 million is excessive, which was mathematically 150% of what plaintiff's counsel requests in closing, then I submit that this court also has a duty to remand for the trial judge to remit in the first instance. I believe that the law requires the court to do that. The statute is clear on the remitted or factors. If the court concludes that the verdict is not supported by the evidence, regardless of what the defendant did, regardless of whether the defendant put in experts, regardless of whether the defendant objected, even if the defendant wasn't even in the courtroom, your honors referenced a billion dollar verdict. You know, what would be too much? 
And the bottom line is, is that if a verdict is excessive compared not to what the defendant did, but what the injuries were that were represented to have been suffered, the court shall reduce the verdict, shall. And I believe respectfully that that applies to the trial judge and to this court. If this court looks at this $11 million future pain and suffering and award, and it says that this verdict compared to the amount of damages referenced by the plaintiff is excessive, then it has a duty to remit. So we just watched a case, the last, what's it, the, to the Shackford case. So the, the plea said that he was to get 10 days of um, community service. And before the, before the judge was ticked off at them, his lawyer said that, you know, you know, he, he's really going to struggle with that part because he works six days a week and he goes to school. I think he said he was 40 years old. I know he has four kids and he works six days a week and he goes to school. So he's like, you know, those 10 days are going to be very hard for him, him to do. Well, after she, she found out that he punched a 62 year old woman in the face, um, she gave him 15 days of community service, which is 150% of what was asked for. So yeah, you look at $11 million and you think, man, that's a lot. It's 150% of what we originally asked for, which is $7.5 million or whatever. But I mean, going 150% over what, you know, um, the plea was, or juries do that all the time. Don't, don't they punitive damages? Don't they award crazy punitive damages all the time so that no one else does this same thing? Um, and the person who suffered gets some type of relief. And aren't we like Americans? We like, that's, we like that about, that's why we pick a jury trial. So the jury can, can pick the punishment for the crime. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that, yeah, $11 million is a lot. And, and they're saying it's more than some people get for death, which is crazy. Um, death should be more than that. But I don't know. This woman's going to be in pain for the rest of her life. Um, I don't know. It's, I heard accident. I heard car accident. I, 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 don't, I don't know how I feel about that because car accidents happen all the time. Unless, I don't know if it was a DUI. I don't know. I have no idea. It doesn't really say unless I missed it. But I don't think 150% is that outlandish. Like if they said 700% or or they, they you know, like you said, a billion, that's that's too far. But, you know, if they said 50 million and they only asked for seven, yeah, that's that's different. But they, they only tacked on a couple million or on millions of dollars to begin with. So now I... I don't see that uh, also in the appeals, don't you have to go because there's a, like a fundamental thing that happened wrong. Like there was an error in, in the, um, in the first trial. I don't see that there's an error, even though she said her reasoning is because they didn't put on a defense. Well, someone should tell them, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's wrong for the judge to tell them that them not putting on any kind of defense led to this because it did. If they would have put on a defense, then then they would have had something else to look at. They don't have anything else to look at because they didn't put it on defense. So that's what she said. I think that I think that that they lose this appeal. I think that the eleven million stands. I don't think I I know the judges here thought that that was not what they would award. But I don't think they're going to overturn a judge and a jury because people lose faith in, in jury trials. If the judges just say, oh, well, I don't like what they said, so I'm just going to overturn it. So I would ask that this court reverse and remand either with instructions to the trial judge to grant a new trial or to enter an appropriate remitter sum. Remitter sum. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Oh, and one more thing. They're in Florida 5th District Appeals Court. Her name is Jessica Long. This lawyer's name is R-E-I-T-E-R. So I, I've looked with all that information. I've been looking online at Florida 5th, and I can't find the appeals case. 
you know, but if anybody ever finds it and, and wants to say who won, put it, put it in the comments, that would be great. I'm not able to find it. through all of them. You know, thanks for hanging out with me today and, and watching the court cases. The next case. Um I will have I will I will try to find more, not to worry. I'll keep looking. Keep watching. I'm watching a um a, a channel right now for Judge Douglas and it's called Jail People. So just that alone sounds promising, right? <laughs> We'll see if I put another video up tonight or tomorrow. It was. If I don't, then they were all boring and, and I wasted my time. But, um, you know, thanks for hanging out with me, guys. You guys, you know, have a good night.